It looks like me. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group, and our guest today is Mary Sarah Builder, who is the Founders Professor of Law at Boston College. And today we're going to be talking about your new book, Female Genius, which is a look at Eliza Harriet, George Washington at the dawn of the Constitution. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Bob. I'm really happy to be here today. So Eliza Harriet, you know, it's two different things I think you're doing in the book. One, you're talking about Eliza Harriet, a woman about whom you found out a lot more than seemed possible. And the other is the idea of female genius and the role of women, particularly an intellectual woman like Eliza Harriet in the formation of the United States. So I don't know where we should begin with Eliza or with female genius. And I'm, I'm happy to begin um, to begin either place. Maybe maybe we should talk a little bit about Eliza Harriet because she's kind of yeah, interesting, yeah. She particularly is. here in Boston. Yes. Yes. So uh, who was she? So, I mean, her dates, I always like it when people tell me the dates, is uh, 1749 to 1811. Mm -hmm. So that's a, you know, really important moment if you if you think about American history and, and the greater sort of British history, you know, beginning uh, before the Seven Years War and sort of ending in 1811 uh, as we're as we're really in you know, the sort of beginnings of a party system in the United right. States, state constitutions. And so her, she's born in um, uh, Lisbon, Portugal, in the British factory um, uh, to British what parents. Mean by factory? Yeah, what British factory. By? So it was a, um, it was a kind of outpost, a trading outpost of the British Empire. And she's born into a mercantile admiralty family, you know, these, these people who are kind of uh, trying to rise up through English society in this period, you know, for the first time in sort of a long time, you could do this. Um, and her father, um, her father's Benjamin Barons, uh, and her mother is Margaret Hardy. And the Hardys are significant admiralty people. Mm -hmm. Her her grandfather was an admiral. Her uncle will be an admiral. Uh, two of her uncles will be governors of New York and New Jersey. And on her father's side, um, her father is Benjamin Barons. And, and many of us in Boston probably may not know about him, but he was, quote, the demon port collector. He sides with James Otis uh, 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 in the famous writs of assistance case sent back several times. So um, uh, drives Hutchinson crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. And so there's a, you know, I don't know if 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 uh, stubbornness is inherited, but if stubbornness were inherited, some of her personality clearly came um, from her father. And so she, you know, she reminds us a lot, I think, um, you know, particularly those of us in New England about how the British Empire in a lot of ways in this period is an empire of oceans and, and oh, yeah. that emphasis on the sort of blue parts of the map. Mm -hmm. So, so she's born in Portugal, and then where does she go after that? What, yeah, so then she trajectory? lives uh, for for most of her early life. She um, is in England some of the time, and her father mm -hmm. ends up working um, in you know patronage positions or a secretary to her mother's brothers, her uncles, and so he's in Boston when she's a little girl before her mother dies. I, I don't think she's she's there in Boston, but um, but she probably comes back. Uh, to New York as a young uh, girl when her uncle is um, governor of New York, and then probably also to Charleston when her uh, dad gets a position as um, sort of the beginning of the postal system into the South. Wow. Uh, so some of the time she's here, a lot of the time she's probably in London, and she goes to a very prominent girls' school, Miss Aylesworthy's, uh, where she probably would have been a contemporary of Polly Wilkes, uh, John Wilkes' mm. daughter. Um, so, you know, sort of sort of an early life that's transatlantic, that's a little bit itinerant, very dependent mm -hmm. on patronage, um, you know, pretty sophisticated. Yeah. So she's trying to, the family is trying to rise then through the ranks of this, um, the British Empire, then it right. is, is the empire of oceans. It's a good way of looking at it. That is going from Boston to Charlestown or from Port Lisbon back to London. I mean, just trying to find new postings and new opportunities. Right. And, and you know, this is that moment, obviously, um, that that people write about where so much of how you rise in British politics is by having a powerful patron. And mm -hmm. that patron both helps you politically, but also sort of sends 
job opportunities your way, yeah, you know, right. these yeah, pensions, yeah. monies, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And um, and unlike um, you know, parts of the British who will come and actually stay in the United States, her family is using the American colonies as a way to sort of rise up within um, right. British society. Right. And then how does she meet her husband who is not English? Yeah, her husband, it's it's so interesting. You know, there's these, the book has some illustrations of this. You know, there's a, a beautiful uh, full length, multiple portraits of her uncle because uh, he was an admiral of the British fleet. Um, there's a beautiful uh, Thomas Lawrence portrait of her cousin. Um, I couldn't find any portraits of herself, but but she sort of, you know, her family's this rising British gentry family. Mm -hmm. And then she marries um, in June of 1776, uh, a sort of Irish Catholic um, young man who's in England uh, at the Inns of Court. And his story is interesting because um, uh, he's he's from Sligo, um, uh, from from basically, you know, the northern parts of Ireland. And he he really shows us this moment when the Irish um, penal statutes that had kept the sort of ancient Irish families um, from rising into power are beginning to fall away. And so he represents the sort of very beginning of this moment when the what one could call it the old Irish gentry is mm -hmm. beginning to sort of see itself as being able to access things. And so he uh, goes to Trinity and then comes to England to study to be a lawyer, which is for the Irish is mostly uh, connections, um, mm -hmm. uh, connections things. And then there in London, somehow, uh, somewhere he meets her and they get married in a way that tells us um, he probably stayed Catholic at that point um, uh, because they don't get married the way that people get married uh, Anglican. And all of the people at their wedding are from his side of the family, are all Irish. Wow. Oh, and wow. so somehow he's not quite who the, the family wanted her to marry. Interesting. Interesting. So what happens then? I mean, she marries yeah. someone, we think, and, and again, you're very careful not to say the things if you were a novelist, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, if so, I was a novelist, it would be a great, you know, romantic oh, yeah. thing. One, yeah. one of the things that I thought that I found was really interesting is that we can't actually know that. And in this period, there's, um, you know, significant for the time period, a number of reports of um, a young Irish um, sort of aspiring gentry actually basically abducting what were called Protestant heiresses, women who hmm. were the sole heirs of their father, which she is, um, and then they enter into a forcible marriage, rape it basically, and marriage. And so we can't know that didn't happen to her. I don't want that to have happened to her. But I, I do, I mean, I know sometimes we have novelistic tendencies in modern histories, but I try to to pull pull back, yeah. <laughs> pull over, let yeah. Hollywood tell the, the romantic story. And right. and the in um after that they go to Dublin for a while. That's mm -hmm. important in the story because uh Dublin is a great space in this moment for sort of rising ideas of uh, the importance of oratory, of rhetoric, mm -hmm. of the art of speaking. Um, it's it's a sort of significant place where people are also beginning to imagine the education of um, women. And then they're back in London in this period in the in the 17 late 1770s, 1780s. And that's important in the story because um, this is, of course, the moment uh, when, um, you know, when London is sort of filled with constitutional reform inside mm -hmm. of itself. And very importantly right. for me is this rising idea about um, female participation. There's mm -hmm. female debating societies who are actually debating whether or not uh, women should be able to participate. And so we can see women's, um, the possibilities of women's participation in this moment as part of a much larger conversation within England about expanding mm -hmm. the notion of, of who gets represented in this sort of constitutional right. space. Right. So neither Eliza nor John has a role in the American Revolution, as we understand it, but they both are in the uh, in a, the, you know, what becomes the United States afterwards. So how do how do they come back to? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think what's important to to think about in some ways about the revolution is we we really focus on the revolution in some ways as a war uh, as an mm -hmm. event about war, um, but the revolution is also a sort of um, a, a different way of looking at it would be it's a means of achieving this 
greater representation in the Constitution. And right. so you can, you can, it sort of depends, you know, which kind of, you know, are you going to go one way or the other way? They're, 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 they're sort of co-linked. Um, but this book really emphasizes revolution as part of a larger constitutional struggle mm -hmm. over representation. Um, that is not just within England, but also we see it right in France and Ireland mm -hmm. right, uh, and the right. United States. And yes. so for me, they're, they're so important in this space in the 1770s and 1780s. They're, they're in some ways really representative of a significant transatlantic group of reformers who mm -hmm. in different ways uh, see this as a moment. So in 1786, they actually crossed the Atlantic um, uh, John probably had been here once before then, but the Treaty of Paris really sort of restores this mm -hmm. um, travel. And they go to New York, which is at that time mm -hmm. the capital. Right, right. Now, it's interesting because we do think not only of the revolution as a series of military events, which John Adams said it wasn't, but also we focus on the United States when, as you said, these ideas are actually transatl uh, transatlantic there. So the basic ideas about constitutional government and reforming structures are being debated not only here, but in Europe. And so they're part of that bigger discussion. And whereas I suppose if they're in Dublin, the first thing on their minds isn't how the American colonies are doing, but rather how this whole idea about liberty, constitutional structure, how that is going. It's a part of right. And, and, and Dublin and the Irish parliament getting back some of its independence is important for the American uh, revolutionary. So in some ways, you know, this is a period where, where people who are interested, people who perceive um, sort of monarchical empire to be um, a corrupt, um, authoritarian and arbitrary, see in all sorts of ways that the, you know, you probably go back to the 1760s, but there's this moment where all sorts of people begin to think, hey, you know, maybe there's space to push some of the boundaries of, of all of the different vectors that sort of comprised, um, you know, 18th century, let's say, monarchical governments. Yeah, and, yeah. and those, you know, the Americans, we know that, right? The Americans for a long time tried to do it without completely declaring independence. Right. Um, right. And so so they're part, they, I think in a lot of important ways, they remind us of the ways in which um, the American Revolution is, is both unique, but also, you know, sort of one example of a much larger set of, um, of political trends. Right. We're, we're talking with Mary Sarah Bilder, the founder's professor of law at Boston College and the author of female genius about Eliza Harriet, George Washington at the dawn of the Constitution. So her husband has, he he's, works as a journalist, but then she starts teaching or has to open to school. So can you tell us a bit about her role then in cultivating female genius? Yeah, so she, so he's never very successful. And, yeah. um, and that's, you know, that's a, that he's actually pretty typical. I mean, he's not atypical. There's a number of people um, with profiles like him. A few of them will be successful, Matthew Carey, but most, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe not even that successful, but yeah. most, most of them won't be that successful. Well, but he's more successful than uh, poor John O'Connor. Yeah, yeah, John O'Connor is pretty unsuccessful. But one of the, you know, everybody in some ways, it's, you know, everyone's trying to make some money if they don't come from any money. And so yeah. his idea is, oh, I'm going to, you know, start a newspaper. I'm going to start a magazine. I'm going to create a subscription book. He's he's never successful uh, at that. And so she's the breadwinner in their family. Mm -hmm. And she does this by one of the only means um, available to women with her background, which is to teach school. And she has an exceptionally ambitious idea about what kind of school she wants to teach. And mm -hmm. so she starts... Um, in New York uh, with what she calls a French and English Academy. And, and you know, if we were to sort of, you know, look at the ad, people might think, oh, it looks like a sort of traditional elite girls school. But if we put it back in the moment, we can see the ways in which it's actually exceptionally ambitious. And we have to remember that college doesn't yet mean what we think it means. Um, mm -hmm. College is uh, educational form that's signified by the kind of approval of the state. And when you look at the age of most men in college, they're like 15, 16. Mm, yeah, yeah. There's always like, oh, this person, amazing. He graduated from no. Princeton, whatever. You know, like, yeah, right. Yeah, like yeah. him and everybody else. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. 
so she she goes to New York and starts this very um, uh, sort of prestigious, ambitious um, girls' school uh, in 1786. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the period, and she madly advertises in the newspaper. Um, mm -hmm. She advertises her exams. Uh, she's giving exams just like um, male schools. And very importantly, she says that she doesn't have enough room for all the audience who want to come see her young girls' examinations. So she reaches okay, out so to the exam is a college. public the, ex the exam is a public, public thing. Yeah, very non-traditional for women in this period. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just beginning to be a thing that boys' schools do. And she advertises them in the newspaper. The exams mm -hmm. will be on this day. And then she says um, they're going to be at Columbia College, and the Columbia mm -hmm. professors are going to help because there wasn't enough wow. room. So wow. she's, in a lot of ways, um, uh, seeing her school as a parallel to Columbia College um, mm. uh, in that way. And, and if you look at the people who she has going to the school, it's the law partner of Alexander Hamilton. It's um, uh, the uh, English ambassador, John Temple's uh, kids. It's the, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name, you know, the guy who owns the fancy house that Washington will actually. Uh, Robert Morris. Not Morris, no, in New York. Um, oh. it'll, it'll pop into my head suddenly. Okay. But anyway, okay. she has like sort of the, the elite of New York um, society. And yet she also publishes, particularly in French, that there's no religious um, faith required, um, hmm. that, uh, it, that school will um, sort of respect liberty of conscience. So she's also not a Protestant school, which, is, which a lot of schools were uh, in this so period. How, so she, go ahead. How old are, how old are her students? So they're pr they look like maybe nine to fourteen or fifteen mm -hmm. um, in in that age uh, group. Yeah, she's just sort of hitting it out of the park, and then um, John realizes that New York is not the place to be. Philadelphia mm -hmm. is, and so he goes to be um, uh, take on the editorship of a magazine, and she then has to move, and that fatefully brings us to the sort of centering uh, of the book. Okay, so. She starts a school in New York. Her husband says, no, my chances will be better in Philadelphia. So off they go. And things are happening in Philadelphia that, you know, you, New York is where Congress is meeting. But Philadelphia is still the largest city, still the trading center, et cetera. So, yeah, I can see opportunities could be better for him. But what about for her and her? Yeah. So, so, you know, Philadelphia is the place to be. It's going to be the convention. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think she's probably sad to leave her school, but there's lots of reasons to think that Philadelphia will be uh, equally good for the kind of education that she has. And in fact, um, there's, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin's daughter is a great patron. There's mm -hmm. a significant group of um, uh, women in Philadelphia who uh, who imagine um, education in this model. And so, you know, it's not it's not a done deal that uh, her career is over. But very yeah. importantly, when she goes to Philadelphia, um, she adopts a different model than she had in New York. This may be mm -hmm. because they're flat broke, which is before she starts promoting her a school, uh, she offers to give lectures and she uh. Uh, advertises a subscription lecture series. And that will be uh, what's very important. She's the first woman um, that I know of, or Granville Ganter, who's also written a piece about early women lecturers. She's the first woman I know to speak publicly in a lecture format in the United States. And she actually gives her lectures um, at the university, the College of Philadelphia. Wow. wow. So what are the lectures? What does she lecture about? Yeah, see, well, we don't have we don't have any papers. She she doesn't have children, and um, uh, they don't have any money. They don't have a big house, mm -hmm. so we don't we don't. No one today has found her papers, but we can reconstruct what her ads mm -hmm. are because she places um, uh, over 150 ads in the newspaper oh. that summer. Uh, almost every day of the summer of 1787, as delegates wrote the convention, the ads of what she called a lady lecturing in the university or the lady in the university's uh, advertisements are there and we can reconstruct uh, her mm -hmm. lectures. So she gave two two lecture series, one never sold tickets, um, but the first one seems to be relatively successful. And that was on um, a language, eloquence, criticism. Uh, it looks a lot like um, uh, William Jones's or Blair's uh, mm -hmm. work, although she would later say that she wrote it uh, herself. And then her second lecture series was on the faculties of the human mind, a kind mm -hmm. of expansive, gender neutral idea about um, 
uh, about capacity. But that lecture series, um, she never actually gives a lecture. But the first lecture oh, wow. series, she probably gives five or six lectures. Mm -hmm. And and you make a point of talking about her contrast with Noah Webster, who's also yeah. on the lecture circuit attempting to. And poor Noah Webster, I think. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a, <laughs> He he does pretty well in history, so I don't feel that bad for him. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. She probably she might have gotten the idea for the lectures from seeing yeah. Webster lecture. Webster had decided, um, you know, again trying to make money, trying to develop a reputation that he would give these lectures mm -hmm. on language, um, but they were incredibly boring, and mm -hmm. um, he was actually pretty offensive to women. Um, he was very yeah. conservative where gender was concerned. Mm -hmm. And and um, he, he really kind of failed in Philadelphia. Um, and so she goes to Philadelphia and is and is more successful. Um, at least she creates the image of that. She writes yes. commentary about herself uh, in the newspaper mm -hmm. saying how successful she is. And uh, but Webster does hear her. Uh, he's the only person we know who recorded her. And he says she was dull. Um, but we take this with a grain of salt because yeah, yeah. he basically called anybody who wasn't himself dull. Um, yeah. And and he, and was he pretty certainly much would know what dull is. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He was pretty much he was pretty much panned. Um, yeah. And and uh, and he also goes to teach for the rival um, educational institution uh -huh. in this moment. So he's not wow. he's not an unbiased witness. No. So, so we're talking with Mary Sarah Builder, author of uh, Female Genius, Eliza Harriet and George Washington and the Dawn of the Constitution. So you've pieced a lot of this together through looking at her ad. She's tremendously entrepreneurial and is advertising her lectures, her school, the uh, exams, all of this using the press in really an interesting yeah. way. Of um, So what else do we know about her that isn't simply from the newspapers? Does she yeah. write much? I mean, I, she doesn't write at all. And, you know, Bob, it's probably worth just just stopping to make the point about newspapers that, you know, this book and a number of recent books we've seen um, coming out on this period are the product of this really fascinating digital revolution we have mm -hmm. where, um, you know, certainly you and I were in graduate school in the days where if you wanted to do newspaper research, you either went to a million archives yeah. and, and checked the little calendar files and tried to figure mm -hmm. out which issues you'd seen and what issues you hadn't seen, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or you sat at the basement of um, yeah. libraries getting yes. dizzy from, yeah. from microfilm. Uh, yes. And so in that period, you know, people did notice her. Charles Warren uh, saw mm -hmm. her ads, uh, Woody, Thomas Woody, who writes on the history of women's education, sees some of mm -hmm. her ads, but you couldn't really put all that together. Yeah. And the amazing thing about, um, you know, institutions like the American Antiquarian Society and other institutions um, digitizing newspapers mm -hmm. is that we can tap into that now mm -hmm. in a very effective way. Hard. It's hard still, but yeah. in a powerful way. And what we see about newspapers in this period is that um, they're more like social media than right. than in some ways our ideas of newspapers. And so particularly on the American side, um, uh, newspaper editors didn't have the capacity to create content themselves. And so they stole content from anywhere they could get content. And so there was a real advantage in in doing something that seemed interesting or writing something that seemed interesting because then you kind of went viral in an 18th century right. sense. And mm -hmm. that is what she's super sophisticated about. So she's yeah. sophisticated about understanding newspapers and she's sophisticated about understanding um, the power that newspapers could have if she can kind of get the right people to show up. Right. And so for right. her, um, in Philadelphia, the right person to have come to hear her lecture is going to be George Washington. Right. And that's who she gets to come and hear her lecture. And that's how we know of her, because Washington records in his diary that on May 18th, waiting for the convention to start, uh, he went to hear her uh, a lady lecture and he thought she was tolerable. And so it's it's but but. You know, we think back on her family, we yeah. think back on the sophistication of her family, and we can understand um, she delays her lecture by a day to make sure probably Washington can come. So this is not, a, you know, this is not coincidence. This no. is, uh, if Washington comes, then then she or her husband write 
ads commentary about how Washington came for a number of days. Right. And then it goes viral. And so you can find records of that um, mm. up and down uh, the um, early United States right. about yeah. George Washington, General Washington, going to hear the lady lecturer in the university. Mm -hmm. OK, so do we know what impact this might have had on Washington, the fact that uh... He went to hear her lecture. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. You know, this is a side of Washington that people have become pretty interested in recently. Um, uh, uh, Washington um, liked women. Um, he spent uh, his diary is one of my favorite sources. And he mm -hmm. spent a lot of time that summer having tea, basically hanging out and talking with women. Um, he was friends very famously with Elizabeth Powell. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's the one who gave him advice, don't step down, the only advice he seems to have taken at the end of his first term. So, right. um, you know, if you if you contrast him to someone like Jefferson, who who mm -hmm. only wrote derisive, right, writes, you know, yeah. horribly derisive, oh, yeah, sexist yeah. things. Washington actually does them. It's an interesting aspect um, of Washington. Mm -hmm. And and we can see his in her influence on him in he leaves um, Philadelphia and buys three books to take back to Mount Vernon, um, all of which were probably which related to her. Yeah. I think most yeah. interestingly, uh, James Thompson, who's the great revolutionary reform poets uh, collection of poetry, but also a modern geography, which is what her school was uh, going to mm -hmm. do. So and then he will support her school when she moves to Alexandria uh, and starts mm -hmm. a school there. So, and you make an interesting case in your book, too, about the gendered language of the Constitution and how it changes from, you know, Congress will be composed of these two houses of men to not a gendered language. That is, would, is it almost envisioning that there will be female geniuses who could be members, be, be citizens? Yeah, or, so, or, I mean... Honestly, Bob, for me, it's so interesting. You know, this is a thing I've worked on for a long time, uh, is getting us to understand that the 1787 Constitution, the way we come to understand it, is really a new genre. Um, we, we misunderstand this because everybody printed the state constitutions as if somebody was like, let us write a constitution that shall be interpreted by judiciaries. But when we go back and look at all of those 1776 to 1787 constitutions at the state level, mm -hmm. we start noticing that they're usually called constitution or frame of government. Mm -hmm. And that's the older vocabulary of constitution as a frame of government, not as mm -hmm. a specific um, document designed to be interpreted in a kind of semantic way. And mm -hmm. for me, this is really important in when we look at this sort of what kinds of voting restrictions or enfranchisement did those documents have? And we can see a variety of possibilities. Massachusetts is pretty unique in a bad way, in my opinion, in being one of the few uh, constitutions in this period that uses the word male. Mm -hmm. And we can guess who might have been somewhat responsible for that word entering in. Um, but a lot of constitutions used, it, used words that were gender neutral or man, which in this time is a, a gender neutral um, piece. And so probably most famously is the New Jersey Constitution, mm -hmm. which only used the word inhabitants, but was mm -hmm. understood to allow women and also people of color uh, to vote. And we know by uh, 1790, explicitly um, statutes basically say he or she and women vote in New Jersey. And yeah. so we again, it's against that backdrop that we now think about the 1787 document. And what's interesting about the 1787 document, and Jan, um, the late Jan Ellen Lewis had really pointed this out, uh, is that there were, there were ways in which sex and gender were referenced in drafts, um, the three mm -hmm. clause, uh, mm -hmm. other places. My, my personal um, most significant one is in the fugitive slave clause. Right. That, advanced very late uh, in August, and the draft language says he or she mm -hmm. aping. And, and, you know, if we just pause there and think about in this world where we're so um, uh, aware of the ways in which African Americans, um, Black women and men who were enslaved worked to create their own freedom, the fact that 
you know, probably Pierce Butler couldn't offer that language without in his own mind thinking mm. of a woman, a right. an enslaved woman, I think is incredibly right. significant. You know, we think of Oni Judge who's going to mm. um, uh, yeah. escape from the Washingtons. And so he or she, so they're in the drafting process, there's all sorts of ways in which the document um, uh, thinks about gender, but then the final mm -hmm. draft is gender neutral and it's gender neutral in 18th century language. So it uses this very um, consistent person to describe mm. And then he is the pronoun. Um, and we right. know that because of the interstate rendition clause, which applies to me and to you uh, and uses right. the pronoun he. And mm -hmm. I argue in the book that that gender neutral language would have allowed the constitution or opened the constitution to be in the same space that, for example, the New Jersey constitution was, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. opposed to picking, right? Like they could have picked to follow the Massachusetts constitution. Yeah which right. is what state constitutions are going to do. They're going to start using male and they're going to start right. using white. Right. And this argument in some ways, right, goes into that whole, it doesn't say that's what they completely intended, but very importantly, the language was open to that possibility. It didn't close that mm. possibility down. And right. I think she matters because, you know, she's there all summer lecturing, mm -hmm. pushing the boundaries. She argues for a very expansive, um, a female academy run by majority women that summer. Um, so I, I think that it's it's not that the issue of women's participation in new areas isn't isn't there. So I I think the language is significant. It doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. enfranchise women completely, but it doesn't bar at the federal level right. when being enfranchised. Right. Right. So does she open her new academy in Philadelphia? Yeah, no. One of the things uh, that I enjoyed writing um, this book, Bob, was you know some some people like Noah Webster and then Benjamin Rush, who we usually tend to think of as good good people. You know, they're yeah. anti-slavery, they're mm -hmm. reformers, they're they seem mm -hmm. very modern in a lot of ways. Um, they come off in different lights, and Benjamin mm -hmm. Rush actually uh, works to make sure that that her academy doesn't. Wow. Uh, come into being. And so the book, very importantly, I think, um, reinterprets that classic text by Benjamin Rush, which is the basis for the Republican motherhood argument, um, reinterprets it as being written mm -hmm. against her. Um, wow. And when you read it from that perspective, mm -hmm. you know, one of the lines that I think uh, you see cited by a lot of historians is this line where he says, you know, the great thing you can aspire to is to be the wife and daughter of an American citizen, right? And we mm -hmm. tend to think like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. But when we think that he's writing that against uh, Liza Harriet O'Connor, married to an Irish, I mean, technically he might not be Catholic, yeah. but basically Irish Catholic yeah. person, yeah. it yeah. has this nativist yeah. sentiment that, um, you know, we might not see when we're embracing him um, in, in his sense. And it's a very, it's a very um, Protestant, uh, anti-Catholic mm -hmm. document, Russia's piece. And it's a very, um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of it that are very, I, I think, far more uncomfortable than people have mm -hmm. read it. It's, it's really fascinating looking, and, and as we know, looking at the whole debate over ratification, it is a debate. Right. So seeing a document like Russia's actually is a convert. It's an argument with someone else. And here you've really shown us Eliza Harriet, who is the person Rush is arguing against. Right. And I think this is a part of thing that we sometimes, you know, we sort of know, but we don't always remember, which is how, you know, you know, we always say, oh, well, you know, guess who gets to write history? They survive. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Rush was Rush was friends with a lot of people. He had a lot of power. He gives his speech at the Young Ladies Academy, which is the competing school mm -hmm. run by men, Protestant mm -hmm. men for for women, and um, and then he publishes it, and mm -hmm. and that's the thing that survives. And to the degree one can argue her ads and her existence are a counterweight, mm -hmm. she vanishes. You know, yeah. she vanishes completely. And I and I think this is really interesting in a lot of fields where what we see newspapers um, and, and not just newspapers, but like people now publishing, um, uh, republishing and allowing through um, digitized books, you know, mm -hmm. books that that were written that turn out to be the other side of an right. argument going right. the other right. way, you know? Right. Yeah, this is great. Great. We're talking with Mary Builder, author of Female Genius, Eliza Harriet, George Washington,
and the dawn of the Constitution. So she doesn't open the school in Philadelphia. So what happens to her after 1787? Yeah, she she moves on, and um, Granville Ganter has this wonderful dis, this sort of word of sort of entrepreneurial lecturers, um, mm-hmm. and you know this is a tradition that will um, last you know into the nineteenth uh, into the nineteenth century, where in order to make money, people decide to give a lecture series, mm-hmm. and you know I remember that weirdly there's a Freddie the Pig that old uh, children's book. Yes, there's a moment in Freddie the Pig where they need money to escape. I think the farm. That's right. And so That's they right. they get up a lecture series, and you That's know, right, so, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And so this is the beginning of this moment um, where you could give a lecture series. You you ideally have a subscription, so you get a lot more money up front. Um, and she will then work her way progressively southward. Uh, offering a lecture series, getting some money, and then trying to start a school. But mm-hmm. in each each place, as she goes, Baltimore, Annapolis, Alexandria, for a brief period, they go to Edenton, Georgetown, working her way down towards Charleston. Uh, her husband, they're either escaping debts across state lines, mm-hmm. uh, or her husband thinks he has a better opportunity. And so she, and and this, this struggle she has um, is, in one of the letters that she writes in after she's started a very successful, again, school in Alexandria for the year, um, her husband says, we're moving to Edenton. And she goes to visit George Washington and Martha Washington Mm -hmm. to talk about, you know, what should she do basically, and basically Mm -hmm. to ask Washington um, uh, for a reference. And it's one of my favorite moments, again, where we see her personality. There's only five letters yeah. uh, extant of hers. Four of those are to George Washington. Wow. And uh, and she doesn't have a carriage. So after she basically invites herself to Mount Vernon, um, she says, but she can't come because she doesn't have a carriage. So Washington has to send the carriage for her. Uh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. I don't know how many people told Washington they better they better yeah. send the carriage. <laughs> That's right. So you can give me advice. So yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. She so did not. Know. She didn't think of herself as a lesser human being in a lot no. of ways, you know. No, no. And then I guess there's a lesson in there for all of us. Yeah, yeah. She yeah, sort yeah. of presumed, you know, to the degree anyone yeah. could imagine themselves as a, as an yeah. equal. She, she yeah. in some ways did. So, do we know what advice Washington gave her? Um, no, we don't. Although he, he won't. He says he'll. He's, you know, he. He was always being importuned to importuned right. uh, to, to sign right. to give references, yeah. and he um, he said he would add a comment to a letter from one of her parents. Um, oh, okay. But so he doesn't he doesn't quite go. But right. but okay. and then she you know she moves on. Then her next big school will be in Charleston, and ironically that will be where she's most successful um hmm. in the early 1790s running a running well, uh, a school that looks a lot like uh academy sort of pushing towards uh, something that looks like a college mm-hmm. okay we and you never she never has children never not that i know of or if mm-hmm. they or if she did in london they have they died um of sickness before they came mm-hmm. over so we've been talking with Mary Sarah Builder, who is the Founders Professor of Law at Boston College and the author of Female Genius, Eliza Harriet, George Washington, and the Dawn of the Constitution. Also, I should mention, author of Madison's Hand, the book which won the Pulitzer, the Bancroft Prize, I'm sorry. It should have won the other one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think the Pulitzer goes to, goes to these kind of books, but I was yeah, very, but, very flattered to have won the Bancroft for it. it that was, was great, really yeah. Great and, honor. Uh, another really close look at document things we think we already knew. And so we would really thank you for writing this. Thank you for joining us. Anything else we should talk about before we let you go? No, I just so happy to happy to be here. I, I work really hard on the book. It's I think it's more readable than any of my other books uh, and has a I lot agree. of pictures. <laughs> Um, yeah, and yeah. that's one of the wonderful things now, um, you know, really university presses have moved towards this kind of trade right, um, press right, book yeah. and let you let you put a lot of pictures in. Yeah, great. So thank you. And I want to thank um, Jonathan Lane, our producer, as well as our many listeners. You know, Mary, when we started doing these podcasts, we thought, we you know, we'll have a handful of our friends in and around Boston. But actually, we have people all over the world tuning in. So I want to thank our 
friends in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and in Guam, and in Jasper, Georgia, Piney Flats, Tennessee, in Pattaya, which I believe is in Thailand, I'm probably saying it wrong, Purgatory, Maine, and Norwalk, Connecticut. Right, we have faithful listeners in Norwalk, and I want to thank all of you for joining us on the Rev250 podcast, and now we'll be piped out on the road to Boston. Thanks, Bob.